All right. Well, that brings us to an introduction for Randy, and I, um, I'll have him give you any additional information he wants to share. But Randy is an extension educator in Clay County, right across the river from me in Moorhead, and he has served there since 2007. His primary job responsibilities are education and outreach in the areas of home horticulture and agriculture production systems. I'm very pleased that we have Randy talking with us today because I know he's truly an expert in his field. So welcome, Randy. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Garden Robinson, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and again, I'm very happy that you invited me to uh, be here this year, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, seed starting at home. And kind of the overview for this uh, particular presentation uh, is going to be as follows. We'll talk a little bit about starting seeds at home, uh, some of the reasons to do that, and we'll move into container selection, potting soil, light, watering and fertilizing, and then finally uh, we'll wrap everything up with seed starting dates. And when you think about starting uh, seeds at home, some of the things that jump into my mind are, are there's generally more selection. And what I mean by that is that if you're starting seeds at home, that means you have to buy them somewhere. And typically nurseries, and that could be mail order nurseries or nurseries that are, are local uh, to you, they generally have more uh, selection of seeds than they do actual transplants. Because with transplants, some varieties sell better than others and they have a little more limited selection but again with seeds they tend to have more selection. Sometimes you'll hear about cost savings and you might be able to save some money but keep in mind that when you start seeds it's not only the cost of the seeds but you also have the containers, you have potting soil and then you're likely going to be providing some supplemental lighting as well and that's going to cost money too. In the end, you know, there might be some uh, savings, but there might not be a whole lot. So just keep that in mind uh, when you hear cost savings. Another thing is that some of our plants need more time to mature. And if you think about some of the most common transplants, you're probably thinking about tomatoes and uh, peppers. They generally, need, for vegetables, for flowers, be geraniums, petunias, they need more time to grow, and therefore we're not able to direct seed those out uh, into the garden. I think above all, at least in my opinion, the most important reason to start seeds at home is that it's fun. And it, it's fun for the whole family. Those of you that have children or grandchildren, it's a great opportunity to instill in the next generation the, the joy to grow plants and whether that's vegetables or flowers or both. With that we're gonna jump right into containers and quite honestly when you think about containers for seed starting you have limitless possibilities. The only thing that's gonna limit your selection is one's imagination. Two things to keep in mind when you are thinking about using or thinking about a container to use is that they need drainage and the container that you select and I'll show you some examples it may not have drainage to start with but you can always add that. Basically you want water to drain out and then have the ability to get rid of that excess water so it's not always contained in that container. Uh, the other thing you want to keep in mind is that you want it to be large enough to support whatever plant it is that you're going to grow. And that's going to be large enough room for that root system to grow so it doesn't get root bound right away. And also to provide enough support for the plant to keep it upright uh, in the container. And we'll start out with what I like to call repurposed uh, containers. And the photo on the left, you're looking at two one-gallon milk jugs. And uh, they're actually growing onions. I grew these at home a few years ago. And I cut the milk jugs, if you measured from the bottom, about four inches uh, in height. And you might be seeing a little bit of difference in terms of uh, the number of plants coming up. And it's actually two different varieties of onions. Uh, one of them had poor germination compared to the other one. If you look at the photo on the right, that's just a close-up of uh, this container here that I have my cursor on. And I just wanted to highlight the aluminum foil that is underneath here. Obviously the milk jugs didn't have any drainage. I just used a knife, 
poke holes in the bottom, and that way I could bring the containers over to the sink. I could water them, let the excess water drain out, and then I always put something underneath just in, just in case they happen to uh, drip some more water. That way it's not going onto the floor. And again, milk jugs work just fine for containers. Another one is uh, um, egg cartons. And this particular one right here happens to be a kind of a the, uh, cardboard or paper mache type egg carton that a person is using. They're growing tomatoes in this one. Uh, this can also work uh, since they are growing tomatoes and this is a rather small container. Uh, what they're doing is they're going to grow them in here for a while, then they're going to transplant to a larger container. Another option for egg cartons would be to use a styrofoam one. Uh, since this is cardboard or a, a paper product, I should say, when it gets wet, they do have a tendency to fall apart. And yeah, therefore using a styrofoam one, you'd probably have a little better longevity uh, of that container. It's going to hold its shape a lot better, easier to move around. A few more options over on the left, we actually have somebody that just put together paper pots. They just took newspaper. These happen to be folded up and they made their planting containers. I do know there are devices you can buy uh, that uh, you can use newspaper. You get it a little bit wet. You can form it around the device and then press it and you can make your own uh, basically disposable or, or uh, decomposable containers. And then on the right, we just have a standard styrofoam cup. These make excellent containers are relatively uh, inexpensive, plus you get a pretty decent soil volume. Uh, you can grow rather, you can grow a plant for quite some time in these. And I would just recommend uh, with the styrofoam cups just to poke a hole in the bottom just to make sure that you have adequate drainage. Moving on to what I consider more of the standard pots, uh, we're looking at a, a compressed peat uh, basically made out of peat moss that's been compressed together, commonly known as peat pots. And uh, we use, we've been using these for a number of years at, at home. And these happen to be some of our geraniums that we grew a few years ago in, uh, in peat containers. And the photo on the right just gives a better example of the variety of uh, peat uh, pots that are on the market. You can get strips uh, right here or you can get some smaller square containers, larger square containers. Uh, you can get round containers too if you would prefer. The, the key point to make about these pots is that they are decomposable, but uh, what you'll typically find is that they don't break down within one year. Uh, usually if you plant um, them out in the garden or you if you have flowers, you're putting them into a container outside. At the end of the season when you pull them out, you're still pulling out part of that container. Uh, the habit that I get it, have gotten into the past few years is that I'll actually remove most, if not all, of that peat container. They typically peel off quite well, and usually I don't have a lot of roots growing uh, into the outside of the, the containers on here, so they come off quite readily. At a bare minimum, what you want to do is at least take the top portion of the container off to make sure that it is not exposed. With these particular containers, if uh, the peat is exposed to the, the surface, it's actually gonna wick water out of the soil and then the plant's gonna dry out, maybe even resulting in death if you're not providing enough water. So just make sure that the peat container is either mostly taken off or you have it completely covered with soil. Another option for containers would be coconut koi, which is what we have right here. Very similar to the compressed peat containers. Uh, these work quite well and I've used them in the past and I've done the same thing. I typically take them off uh, or peel them off uh, prior to planting outside uh, just to make sure that the roots can uh, get out just fine. And again, for the same reason of not wanting to uh, wick out water from the soil uh, into the atmosphere. Another uh, option that a person can use are these containers over here. And one of the brands would be a, a Jiffy container or a Jiffy pot. And basically what you have is compressed peat and these come in a pellet. And then you put that pellet into warm water and they'll expand. And that's what you're seeing right here is the expanded uh, Jiffy pellet. And it's nice because it already has a hole in it. All you have to do is, is put your seed in there, cover it, and these, usually the roots will grow right up the side of the, the there's like a, a bag that is around here. 
Now that's quite, um, it has really small pores, but the roots tend to grow right through it. And uh, you can just plant them right in the garden or the container. Uh, these two work quite well. What's real common, and if you buy, a, say, a whole package in the store where you have the, the flat with an insert, uh, this is typically what you're gonna, what you're gonna be getting. Um, we actually have a standard greenhouse tray, and if you follow my cursor here, our standard greenhouse tray is right here. I have a better photo of that uh, coming up. Inside this greenhouse tray, we actually have a, an insert, a plastic insert, which is what we're looking at right here, right here, and the same over here. And the plastic inserts, you have a different, you can get different cell sizes. For example, the one right here, I believe there are about 128 um, planting cells in this um, standard greenhouse flat. And then right next to it, we have 72 cells. And then the one over here, we have, uh, there are 48 cells. So obviously the more cells you have, the smaller the, the cell space. What I've been using over the past few years for most of my transplants and for vegetables and flowers, we uh, use them for marigolds. And then for vegetables, I use these for peppers, tomatoes, um, uh, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. The, uh, the 48 uh, count trays uh, tend to work quite well. There's enough rooting volume in, in my opinion. So to me, these are, are great to use. Another option would be just individual uh, plastic pots, which is what's being shown right over here. And usually with, the, with individual pots, whether they be plastic, peat, coconut koi, or the, the inserts that I showed you in the previous slide, like I said, we're all putting those into to a greenhouse flat. And that's what's pictured right here. Only this greenhouse flat is, has been filled with uh, the uh, peat containers. Um, but this greenhouse flat, it measures two feet in length, and then it's one foot wide. And the plastic inserts, they fit right inside of here. Um, the one nice thing about these greenhouse flats is that you can purchase these with no holes in the bottom. Uh, which work wonderful because you can water your plants uh, in here, let everything soak through, and then you can just hold, you can just pick this up and just dump the water out one of the corners and you don't have to worry about it making a mess uh, at all on the floor. The one thing I will caution about with plastic containers is that usually you can reuse them. Um, for more than one season, but you want to make sure that you're going to somehow sanitize those containers from year to year. A few years back, I ended up getting a, uh, a root rot disease, growing some geraniums because I didn't do a good enough job um, cleaning out my plastic containers. Uh, what I would recommend and what's usually recommended in most extension publications is to use a 10% bleach solution which would be one part bleach to nine parts water and you want to make sure that you get all the soil uh, all the potting soil washed out uh, beforehand and then soak them in that solution for at least a half hour and then uh, take them out and that should be good enough and you can use whatever sanitizer uh, you want but um, bleach tends to do a pretty good job uh, the other option is you can just use brand new containers um, every year and that way you don't even have to worry about uh, carrying over disease. All right, moving into uh, potting soil. The, the function of our potting soil uh, is basically has four parts to it. Number one, it's going to be a reservoir for plant nutrients. Essentially, all the nutrients that a plant is taking up is coming from uh, the root system for the most part. Uh, the potting soil is also going to hold water. Uh, for the plants to take in. Uh, the potting soil also needs to provide good gas exchange, meaning that we need to have um, enough oxygen that is in the soil in order to have respiration occur, which the roots do need to respire in order to be uh, healthy. And the potting soil is also providing anchorage uh, for the plant. In some cases, if, if you're in an area where you have a nice loam soil, you could go out and make your own. And the general recipe for that would be two parts of loam soil, one part sand, and a rather coarse sand would be ideal, and then one part organic matter. You know, whether that'd be compost or uh, maybe some sphagnum moss, 
Uh, something along those lines. Uh, bear in mind though that if you do that, if you happen to have any disease organisms in the field soil or your loam, uh, you would be carrying those uh, inside and that could potentially be getting uh, onto your plants. One way to get around that is that you could take your loam soil and put it into an oven and you know you could essentially cook it for a while to um, uh, basically try to kill some of those disease causing organisms. What I find the easiest is to avoid field soil uh, altogether and go with something that's called a soilless mix. And usually you'll see it sold as a potting soil or even a seed starting mix. What the soilless mix means is that there is no basically no soil components to it. So we don't have any sand, silt, or clay uh, in in that particular soil. Usually they're gonna contain um, peat moss. Usually it's gonna be sphagnum peat. And the interesting thing with peat is that it holds a lot of water. And it's a, it can hold up to about 60% of its volume uh, in water. It's relatively slow to decompose and it's acidic in nature. The pH is around three or four and neutral would be seven. So again, it is a, a very acidic. Another component to most of the soilless mixes is vermiculite. And vermiculite is going to have really good water holding capacity and it also helps with aeration. And another component that you'll usually find is perlite. And perlite is just there for aeration. And in the next slide I'll show you some photos of, of each of those. On the top left we have some sphagnum peat. This has been ground up and most of your seed starting mixes it will be ground up and the reason for that is that you want a fine mix for seed starting and that way you can maximize the seed to um, potting soil um, connectivity. Basically you want to have good seed to soil contact to help with germination. Moving over to the photo on the right, uh, right here where my cursor is at, that brownish material, that is vermiculite. And just to the right of that, the white material, that is perlite. And again, usually the biggest component or the, the one that has the most volume in the mix is going to be uh, sphagnum peat moss or, or just peat moss. And then you'll have varying amounts of vermiculite and perlite. Another option if you don't want to use uh, peat moss is ground coconut koi. And this has become popular over the well, past several years. And essentially, if you think about a coconut, you know that you're eating the coconut seed. Well, basically from the shell outward, that is what is used for coconut koi, and it's basically just ground up. And that is what you're looking at uh, right here. It has some pretty good properties uh, for, for seed starting, to use in a, a seed starting mix. As a general rule, uh, when you're using potting soil, always fill your containers with the dry mix. And the reason for doing that is it's not going to compact on you. You can put the, the dry mix in and then you can fill it up all the way. So level with the top. And that's what these were to start with. They were level with the top. And then once that is done, you can just take the container or in, in this case, you could just take the tray and just hold it maybe an inch or two above a, a hard surface and just drop it. And basically you just tap it and that'll help settle down the mixture. And then if you need to, you can add some more. Once that is done, go ahead and water the, the mix. What you'll find, if the mix is dried out and it has a lot of peat in it, sometimes it is very hard to, to get that to re-wet. And it could take 20 minutes, a half hour for water to actually be taken in or uh, adsorbed by the, the, the soilless mixture. So, you know, once it's filled, make sure you give it a really good soaking and that it's absorbing water. And then once that is done, then you can go ahead and, and seed. Just make a small hole um, to the depth, uh, whatever depth it is that you need to seed at. Um, go ahead and, and cover it up. And then I always water after I seed. And the reason that you're doing that is that you can end up having a, an air pocket here or there during the seeding process. Once you rewater after seeding, uh, very carefully that is, you should be able to get rid of those gaps and you're gonna have really good seed to potting soil contact, which is what you want. And then once that's done, just go ahead and you can cover your container with either like a saran wrap or some type of a cling wrap. 
that's what I've been using. Or some of these uh, containers will actually come with a plastic dome that you can go ahead and, and put over the top. And essentially what you're doing is trying to keep in the moisture. And that way you're not gonna have to water quite as often um, while these seeds are starting the, the germination process. And once the seeds germinate and they come into contact or just before they come into contact with that plastic cover, uh, just go ahead and, and take that off. Uh, now that we've talked about um, our containers, we've already talked about using potting soil. At some point, you're likely gonna have, if you're growing these indoors, you're likely gonna have to provide some supplemental light to the plants. Um, as you all know, you know, plants essentially produce their own food. And here's an equation for photosynthesis, uh, very basic here. Um, plants are using carbon dioxide and water, and then with the presence of light energy, they're able to make sugar, and of course they're giving off oxygen. And plants are gonna use this sugar um, for respiration, which essentially plants are using it for growth and maintenance. Um, but it's important that plants are gonna have enough light to photosynthesize so they can actually grow. And I wanna show you this next figure. And if you look at this orange line right here, um, you can see that photosynthates, which essentially would be your uh, sugar, and uh, that's what the, the plants are gonna be using for growth. So that's what's being highlighted right here. The, uh, the dash line, that would be photosynthates used in, in respiration, which basically is just maintenance respiration. So the plants are just maintaining themselves so they can um, stay alive. And the green area that is right in here, that's the growth potential. And when you look at the bottom, down here, we just have temperature. And all that is saying that as temperature increases to a certain point, we're gonna have an increase in the amount of photosynthesis, hence the amount of photosynthate that is produced. And also respiration is going to increase. But the key point here is our growth potential. As long as we have more photosynthates that are being produced than what is needed for basic maintenance, which is right here, we're gonna have plant growth. And in most cases, if you're growing plants indoors, um, you're going to have to provide them supplemental light. Looking at this next slide, um, what we're going to show right here is uh, we're going to look at chlorophyll. And essentially, chlorophyll is what is intercepting light energy. And if you look across the bottom on this one, we just have the wavelength of light. It's given in nanometers. And I just want to highlight basically chlorophyll A and B. There's many more other uh, chlorophylls and also some other pigments that are gonna be intercepting light. But I just wanna highlight these two right here. So we have a peak between 400 and 500 um, in, in terms of the uh, chlorophyll being able to intercept that particular wavelength of light. And then we also have another peak just past about uh, 650 to um, 700. And and again, this is where the, the chlorophyll is intercepting light that's being used to essentially produce sugar. And if you look at the figure just underneath of that, and I tried to match up the wavelength, it's not exact, but it is uh, close. And what we're looking at is basically the amount of light from different sources. And if you look at this line right here, the one that's given off quite a bit of light, we have full spectrum or, or sunlight. And ideally, sunlight is, would be the best source of, of light for plants. Bear in mind, in a home setting, we don't always have that option because we don't always have really good south-facing windows. And also in the winter, even if we do have good south-facing windows, um, we may not be getting enough light. And if you look at the cool white fluorescent line, which is what I wanna draw your attention to right now, which is this line right here, uh, you can see it has a few peaks um, in its wavelength, and it kind of lines up with chlorophyll A and B. It's, it's not perfect, but it is somewhat lining up over there. And then we do have some um, of the wavelength uh, that, that plants are going to use around that 650 to 700 range in there. 
the only point I want to illustrate with this is that you can grow plants using a standard cool white fluorescent light and you shouldn't have an issue in in most cases so you wouldn't have to go out and purchase um, what are known as like a, a plant light or a more I think sometimes you're even called a, a maybe a full spectrum light usually they're going to be more expensive than a cool white uh, fluorescent bulb and again I've I've grown plants with cool white fluorescence for quite some time and and you can get by uh, using just that uh, generally speaking in, in terms of how long you need to have your lights on. With fluorescent lights, the recommendation is anywhere from 12 to 16 hours uh, per day. And I would, to have, say, really healthy transplants, if you're growing maybe onions, geraniums, petunia, um, you know, maybe you're gonna have broccoli, kohlrabi, I would stick towards 16 hours of, of uh, daylight, um, or 16 hours of light per day. The easiest thing to do is just have your lights hooked into a system where you can have it hooked up to a timer and just set your timer for 16 hours on and then have it off for eight hours. And as long as it's on a timer, you don't have to worry about turning them on and off. With fluorescent lights, you want to keep them at the plants at least within four inches. And I would say ideally two inches um, from the fluorescent light. As that fluorescent light uh, increases in height from that plant canopy, you're just going to get far less light. I will say that um, using an LED is definitely a viable option. LEDs have come down in cost uh, quite significantly in the past few years. And in fact, I've even seen some now where you can get them as a, basically it's a four foot replacement bulb for a shop light and it has the prongs on the end. So it'll fit into a say a standard shop light that was used in a fluorescent in the past. The one nice thing with LEDs is that they use far less energy. So you can cut your cost even more if you use, uh, if you use an LED. Plus they tend to be brighter, just meaning that you're getting uh, more light. And what I, wanna, uh, what I wanna point out here is that if you use LEDs, bear in mind that the, uh, the four inches or less recommendation for an LED, uh, may not be quite accurate. You may find that you have to increase the height a little bit um, from, the, uh, from the height of the canopy with an LED, just because it could be a little bit uh, too bright. Usually what you'll find if you're getting too much light on plant leaves, they tend to bleach. And if that's the case, all you have to do is uh, uh, just raise the height of the, of the lights and you should be in good shape. I wanna show you some examples of uh, some different uh, lighting systems to use. Right here, you're looking at what was actually sold as a plant light stand. And we have uh, three levels or, or uh, three shelves here, one, two, and three. And each shelf has just one fixture and it has uh, two bulbs in it. These happen to be T5s uh, that are fluorescent, uh, the, the T5 fluorescent bulbs. So it's, um, the bulb isn't as big as what you'd have in a T12, but the T5s are, they use less energy, uh, a very good deal. And then they also have a reflective shield that is on here. So all the light is actually directed down and the plants on here grew just fine. Another option, this one would be probably a little more a lower cost in the long run. Granted, this person actually has a lot of, a lot of plants, excuse me, being grown, uh, but their setup wasn't all that expensive. They just have pallet racking as their, uh, as their shelving units on here. And these are just four foot lights. And their lights are, are larger than say the, the standard shop light. Instead of just holding two bulbs, uh, this is actually holding four, but it would be essentially the same if you were to go out and buy two shop lights and each of those shop lights holds two fluorescent light bulbs, uh, two four footers, you would have the same thing. So basically you can think of two shop lights um, per shelf and then you could grow your seedlings underneath that. And they have their standard um, greenhouse flats here uh, lined up. And again, the fluorescent lights are providing the, in this particular case, providing all the lights uh, for their plants. And here's another photo of some tomatoes. And you can see how close they have the, the, uh, um, 
the light fixture to the, the plants. There may be an inch or so. And in fact, with fluorescence, even if the foliage touches the bulb, probably not going to be a big deal. I wouldn't recommend having the plant foliage touch the bulb, but it's usually not going to harm anything because they're not putting out that much heat. But again, the key is to have your, your um, lights close enough to the plants. Um, if they're not close enough, what will end up happening is that they, they tend to get just kind of long and, and stretched out with a very weak stem. I've just spent a few minutes telling you how you'll likely have to have supplemental lighting to grow your seedlings. And I would say in most cases, that's what's going to be necessary. However, I do want to tell you about a project that I worked on. This has been a few years back. I was working with a seventh grade science teacher at Horizon Middle School in Moorhead. And one of the things that she had her students do was to grow a flowering plant from seed. And this usually occurred from December and they ran the project into April and May. And all the plants were started from seed and the seeds were grown under fluorescent lights. But once they were grown under fluorescent lights, um, what they did, they transplanted them and then put them out into their locker bay. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute here. So here's that light stand that I showed you earlier. And this is what the students use to start their plants. And once they um, got large enough and they transplanted them to a larger container, they put them out into, into their locker bay. And here's a photo of the, the locker bay. And I just wanna highlight the windows that are right here. And those of you that aren't familiar with this particular school, these windows that are right here face south. And I suspect they're probably about maybe eight, nine, ten feet tall, something like that. Just a wonderful light source. And here's a photo after the students were done transplanting all of their, all of their plants. And bear in mind, this photo was taken probably late December. And this happened to be 2013 right here. Uh, but again, pretty low light levels in, in Minnesota at that time in our, in our area. And then with, within two months, this is what the students had for plants. You can see some sunflowers towering over here and some zinnias. And about a month and a half, two months after this photo was taken in 2014, the instructor wanted to showcase the students' plants that they, that they grew. And that's what I have, um, that's what these photos are from. And we got some tomatoes right here. I just want to point out the, the fruit that is formed on some of these. And the students were actually picking fruit from their tomato plants. And again, bear in mind, these were grown um, basically with, with natural light um, sitting on their, basically sitting on the, the shelf by their, uh, by their lockers. And it was up to the seventh grade students to water and fertilize their plants if they wanted to. And just a few more plants showing some more tomatoes. They just they did absolutely amazing. Here's some more fruit right here. One young man wanted to grow sweet corn and you can see he actually has three ears of sweet corn right here. And uh, we had some that grew cucumbers. I just wanna highlight this cucumber right here. And again, this has been growing indoors, natural light. I just wanna highlight another one. And I have my pen stuck by it. So probably about six, seven inches. Yeah, not bad for, <clears throat> for plants being grown indoors with natural light. And here are some sunflowers that, that the students uh, also grew and, and some more zinnias right here. And like I said, in most cases, we're not gonna have windows like they have at, at a school that are letting in enough light. Uh, so again, in most cases, we're gonna have to provide supplemental light, but if a person's fortunate enough and you have windows that are giving you enough natural light, you may not have to provide a supplemental light source. Uh, after lighting, another thing you want to keep in mind is uh, the amount of water as well as the amount of fertilizer that is being put down. And generally speaking, you're just wanting to keep the potting soil moist uh, during the germination process. And you don't want it, you know, soggy by any means, but you don't want it to dry out either because those seeds, as they're germinating, are in a very vulnerable state. If they dry out, uh, it's very easy to kill them at that point. And again, you want to make sure that you have drainage of some sort in your container. After you water, let the water, excess water drain out and then make sure that excess water is dumped out if you have your uh, tray or your containers setting inside of a larger tray. 
that is waterproof. And then as far as fertilizing goes, it's not recommended to fertilize until we have true leaves. And I want to point out a true leaf to you or tell you the difference between cotyledons and true leaves. If you look at the plants that are growing right here, I believe these are tomatoes if I'm not mistaken. We have a seed that just germinated. These are the cotyledons right here. And if you look at the one right next to it, uh, these are the cotyledons. And right here we have what are known as true leaves. At this point, it is safe to uh, fertilize these plants. When it comes to fertilizer, we want to make sure that we're not going to overdo it. It is far better to under fertilize than it is to over fertilize. And as far as fertilizing, usually the common recommendation is every one to two weeks. That will vary some depending on what crop you're growing. Some of the vegetables might need a bit more frequent fertilizer uh, than what uh, say some of the other vegetables or other flowers uh, might need. And in general, I would recommend a, a water soluble fertilizer. Basically, you know, maybe something like, like miracle Grow or something along those lines where all you have to do is add it to water, it dissolves right away, and then you can go ahead and, uh, and apply it. Usually a general purpose um, water soluble fertilizer is recommended and that general purpose means the, the three numbers that are on the fertilizer container, which would represent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, they're going to be in equal amounts. So maybe it's going to say a 10-10-10 or a 20-20-20. Uh, something along those lines would be just fine to use. And just make sure that you're following label directions on there. It might have uh, a table on there that'll tell you how much to use for seedlings, or at the very least, it should mention house plants or container plants. Um, and just go ahead and follow uh, label directions, and that way you're not going to over, over fertilize. And I want to talk a little bit about over fertilizing, and this is something that, that I did myself. If you've been looking at this picture, you may be thinking that, gosh, these plants look kind of sickly, where I have my cursor, and, and they are uh, sickly looking because for a couple of weeks, I was providing far too much fertilizer to these geraniums. And what ended up happening is that they lost most of their leaves. And I ended up killing actually a few of the geraniums in here. A lot of them rebounded. Geraniums are, are pretty tough plants and, and they came back after being outdoors, or uh, actually after they were planted outside, they rebounded in a, in a matter of a few weeks. But my point is it doesn't take long to um, kill or greatly harm seedlings uh, when you over fertilize. Just remember that it's always better to under fertilize uh, versus over fertilizing. The last thing I want to talk about here are the uh, seed starting dates. And it's important that you start the seeds early enough because um, you want to make sure they have enough growth before you plant them outside. At the same time, you don't want to have transplants that are extremely large uh, going outside because when they get too large in a container, if they're root bound, they tend not to transplant all that well. Um, and these are just some, some general guidelines. So we have the, roughly the month when to start them. The weeks of growth indoors that are typically needed before they're transplanted outside. And again, this is just a guideline. And then I just have some examples of flowers here and, and vegetables. For example, if anybody is wanting to start seeds relatively soon, um, geranium, wax begonia, violas, or pansies would be perfect to start right now. And if anybody grows onions from seed, now would be a great time to get those um, seeded indoors. And, and you know, now or within a few days, you're going to want to get those going. We start getting into uh, the middle of March, for example, some of the flowers that would typically be planted about that time would be cleom, uh, marigold, nicotiana, sweet alyssum. And the vegetables that we would typically be planting at that point would be um, pepper and eggplant. And then a couple weeks after that, um, early, maybe even to the middle of April, we're looking at calendula, celosia, celosia excuse me, uh, portulaca. And then for the vegetables, we'd be looking at um, tomato. And tomato doesn't need as much time as what pepper and eggplant do. And that's why tomatoes are started a little bit later in the season. Uh, and then late April, early May, um, not much for flowers indoors at, at this time, but it would be a great time 
if you wanted to start your vine crops, cucumber, cantaloupe, muskmelon, pumpkin, winter squash. Typically, if you're going to start those because you want transplant to go outdoors to get a jump start, you want about a month um, of grow in time before you're putting them outdoors. You don't want them um, too large uh, going outside, uh, but starting them indoors at least to get a little bit of a jump start on the season. And finally, with your, um, with your seedlings, before you actually plant these outdoors, whether it be in the garden or in a container, you want to make sure that they are going to be hardened off. And what that means is that you want to, you want to acclimate them to the outdoor conditions. And, and roughly maybe two, maybe even three weeks before you plan on um, planting them, start putting them outside. And what I do, I'll take them on a nice day, put them out in the shade and where they're protected from the wind and leave them out for a few hours. And then I always bring them in. Uh, if not, um, if not after maybe three, four hours for sure before nightfall, bring them inside and then every day start to leave them outside a little bit more or a little bit longer. And then gradually starting to put them in more and more sunlight. And that way, by the time you actually transplant these outside, uh, they're going to be used to the, the sun and, and the environment. They're going to be used to having some wind on them. And they will establish far better than just taking them from inside your house and then sticking them in a container or uh, right into the garden. Uh, again, it's important to make sure that they're, they're hardened off properly before uh, planting outdoors. With that, um, that is the end of the presentation. If we happen to have any questions, I'd love to take them at this time. Does anyone have any questions? You can type them in your chat box. Or at this point, you can also click on the unmute and you can ask him out loud if you'd like. Oh, Tara is asking, I don't know if you can see these, Randy. Um, was there a printout of slides for this? And the answer is, we will be putting the PDF of these slides on our Field to Fork website. You can see that on the screen. And I also will be um, putting up a couple other pieces. One is a link to the University of Minnesota Extension pieces, and also to a horticulture piece that was developed at NDSU. So yes, you will have lots of resources. Um, Randy, are you seeing these questions? <laughs> yes, now I am I'm starting to see them. I see one here. Let me see. Uh, where are we at? Oh, the advantage of starting onion from seed versus buying sets. Um, probably not a, not a whole lot of difference. If you're buying onions as actual transplants, there wouldn't be any difference um, than, say, buying transplants versus starting seed on, on your own. Um, if you're buying um, the actual bulbs uh, from the store, generally speaking, the, the ones that you're starting from seed or the ones that you buy transplants of, you get a larger bulb uh, in, in the end. At least that's what I've, I have observed um, when, I've, when I've grown them uh, side by side before. But again, a lot of that's because of the variety of, of onion that you're getting. Because your variety is quite limited if you're buying in bulbs. But if you're starting from seed, uh, you have a lot of options uh, that are out there. Let's see, and I see another one that, that asks if, if, if anybody's used any LED lights. I have not used any LED lights personally. I, I do have a friend that uh, breeds roses and nine barks, and he uses a mix of, uh, of fluorescent lights as well as LED lights. And he hasn't noticed a whole lot of difference uh, in growth, but again, the, the LEDs you can save a significant amount of money because they're using far less energy. Um, with the LEDs versus the uh, uh, versus the fluorescent. And then I see another one here. Do you find that you need to transplant your seedlings into bigger pots? And in, in some cases, yes. But what this largely depends on is the size of container that you um, start your seeds in. I used to start them in smaller containers and then transplant to larger ones. Now I just start my seeds in larger containers and I don't even worry about transplanting. And I, I to me that it's, it's easier because it's a little more time up front, but 
on the back side of it, I'm saving time because I don't have to transplant. Uh, quick question on replanting after no germination. That was me. All right, Bree, I, I would say go right ahead and and replant. If you're using a soilless mix, I wouldn't be concerned about having some sort of a disease in there that caused, you know, caused you to have poor germination. It could just be the seed. Sorry, I have my two-year-old. Um, no, so last year I tried uh, redoing my, or I tried growing my plants indoors, and some of them sprouted and some of them didn't. So I didn't know if you could still reuse, like you said, um, if I could still reuse the soil and stuff from those that didn't germinate and just keep replanting. If it if it's the, the same season, I would go ahead. So for example, if you're going to start some seeds pretty soon, some don't come up go ahead and, and uh, try reseeding into those same containers. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't keep your soil for more than a season if it's right. been used. I would, I would get rid of it. But again, if you're pretty sure that you have clean containers to start with, you have, you know, you have a soilless mix, I don't think there's any harm in you know, giving it another go because it could just be the seed that you're using. Sometimes um, you, you just end up with poor germination, you know, whether it's a seed or or it could even be the environment, but I would go ahead and give it another shot. Okay, and um, then I did have small little black bugs last year. How do you get rid of like the little, you know, insects or do you just not worry about them? It's a great question. Without knowing what kind of an insect you're dealing with, I have a hard time uh, offering any control advice. One insect that I've noticed a lot of, and I don't know if this is what you have, uh, what you were dealing with, they're known as fungus gnats, fungus gnat, excuse me, and it is like a little fly. They're not a very aggressive flyer by any means, but when they're disturbed, they'll, they'll fly up. And the fly itself doesn't cause any harm, but the larva of the, the fungus gnat, they can feed on, or at least close to developing roots, and they can cause some damage. And usually you're going to have those if the soil has been overly, kept overly moist. Usually keeping it a little bit on the dry side will help. Sometimes some of the potting mixes that a person gets, you know, you can have uh, insects that come in uh, with that. So it just comes down to making sure that a, a person's purchasing a, a, a reputable um, potting soil. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I see another one. Should you rinse the pot with clear water uh, after having been treated with bleach water? And you sure could. In, in the past, you know, we've always soaked them in bleach water, and once they've dried, we haven't worried about washing them with, uh, with clean water. But if you wanted to give them uh, a wash with clear water after they've been soaking, you know, for at least 30 minutes, that would be fine too. I don't see any harm with that. Another question, do you ever leave a fan blowing on your seedlings? Uh, does this make the stem stronger? Great question, and the answer is yes, I have. In particular for tomato. Tomato tend to grow quite fast indoors, and you end up having a very uh, long stem. And actually, you got a couple of options. One, you could leave a fan blowing, and it wouldn't have to happen wouldn't have to be 24 hours a day. You know, leave it on for a few hours because that motion going back and forth on that stem, it's going to strengthen it, you know, maybe even increase a little bit of the, the width or the girth of the, of the stem. The other option is every day, uh, just take your uh, seedlings, just take your hand and just rub it right over the canopy. And just do it a few times. So basically, you know, you're knocking them back and forth, which is given the same stimulation that a fan would. You're doing it just a couple of times or maybe three or four times with your hand as opposed to having a fan actually blowing on them. But usually you'll get the same result uh, with that. And then another one, um, can you use incandescent energy efficient light? You probably could. I mean, incandescents are going to give off a, a, a different spectrum of of light, so it could very well be possible. I don't have any experience growing plants under uh, incandescent lights. All of my experience has been with uh, using uh, cool white uh, fluorescence. Uh, another question here, tap water or well water? And then at what temperature? I would say whatever you have access to is going to be fine. I guess the one caution on well water, you know, if you happen to have a lot of uh, 
a lot of salts or a lot of alkalinity in there that could potentially pose a problem, but I would assume at that point, you know, you probably have some type of a water conditioner that is um, taking that out. With tap water, assuming it's running through a water softener, granted you are gonna have maybe some more salt in that water, you should be fine for seedlings because you're not going to be growing them inside for you know the whole season they are going to be going outdoors what i would recommend is that every time you water um, go ahead and water and then once you're done with the first water follow it up with a second watering and what that'll do is that 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 first watering if there's any salt that is building up it will dissolve it in in water, which would be your water soluble salts. And then that second watering, you can flush everything through. And that way you're not gonna have a buildup of, of salts. And again, for the few months that you're growing seedlings indoors, um, you shouldn't be having a, a problem with this. So I would say, you know, either whatever you have access to is great. And if you can keep it on the warm side, um, you know, if it's warm to touch, I think that would be, would be perfect. Uh, do you do anything different when growing spinach indoors? Um, I don't grow any spinach inside, so I, I don't have a good answer for that question. Let's see, another one here. My eggplant leaves bleach and die. Is that due to the lights being too close? I guess it's possible. If you're using fluorescent lights, I, I just don't think you're having your, I don't think your lights are, are too close. Although maybe if you have a very high output fluorescent light, maybe there's a, there's a chance. I would try raising your lights up and see if that, if that helps. Another question, should the potting soil be sterilized before using? Uh, will this reduce unwanted pathogens or fungus? Uh, the answer to that would be, would be uh, yes. I mean, having it sterilized would definitely reduce any unwanted pathogens or fungus if it's present. Although I will say most of the soilless mixes when you're buying them, they, I, you're, you're probably not gonna have to go through and, and actually sterilize those if you're buying a reputable um, potting soil. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about going through and try to sanitize or, uh, or sterilize uh, the soil. But again, if you wanted to, it's, it's sure not going to hurt anything. But again, with the soilless mixes, you usually don't have to do that. Uh, curious about the students' indoor fruit bearing plants. How did pollination take place? Excellent question. With tomatoes, you don't need a pollination from um, you know, say by bees or, or by, an, by an insect. Uh, what the students would have to do with tomatoes, uh, tomatoes will rely on wind or, you know, say a bumblebee, for example, would come in and uh, they just need something vibrating that flower to release that pollen. Uh, in an indoor environment, as long as you're tapping the flower for the, the tomato, even somebody walking by can cause enough of a disturbance to release pollen. Uh, so the tomatoes were relatively easy. With the cucumbers, you may, depending on what kind of variety you're growing, you may end up having to take pollen uh, from a male flower and then physically do uh, pollination to be able to get fruit set. And with the cucumbers, I don't recall if the students actually went through when they were taking male flowers and, and doing the pollination themselves, or if they had a variety that was for the most part uh, would produce uh, fruit without actually um, having pollination take place. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we'll need to wrap up questions. <laughs> that, that sounds good. Um, uh, with that, again, thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you so much, Randy. This was a great session, and I think we are all anxious for spring. So I thank everyone for their participation, and I hope to see you next week and in subsequent weeks. We will be archiving this webinar if you want to watch it again, and we'll in the future we'll get the PowerPoints available as printable PDFs if you want to do that. So thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again. And special thanks to Randy for, wow, can you think on your feet? Good job. <laughs> no, thank you.